Right. Okay. So hi, everyone. Welcome to our Friday forecasting talks. I think we have everyone uh, here with us. Um, today, we are talking about machine learning forecasts and we'll have uh, Anne Fleur. And she will tell us about uh, confirmation bias or value head of machine learning. But before we do that, I'll make a short uh, introduction to the center and these webinars. So this slide that you see summarizes what the center does and who we are. Um, you can see that we have a variety of services, bespoke short courses, consultancy, summer projects, and so on. We help uh, software developers. Uh, we, we have more long-term projects like PhD research projects or knowledge transfer partnerships, and we have shorter ones. So if a company has a pro problem that uh, they need to solve, uh, you can always get in touch with us and we will find uh, the appropriate way of work with you. We have uh, an expertise in marketing analytics, in supply chain forecasting, in machine learning, um, inventory management and other areas. And here you can see our members of staff. These are the people that work at Lancaster University, but we have all other people who do not work at the university, but are still affiliated with the Center for Marketing Analytics and Forecasting. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us, there are different ways. We have a Twitter account at Lancaster CMUF. We have LinkedIn, and most probably you came here to this webinar via LinkedIn. Uh, you can contact us directly using email. Um, we have a website which is being refurbished. So maybe in the month you will see a completely different amazing website which will summarize our services even better than the one that we have at the moment. And we have a YouTube channel where we publish um, recordings of these webinars and we plan to publish some educational videos related to forecasting. Last but not least, we have this web page, the landing page of the webinars, Friday Forecasting Talks, where we publish the previous events and the upcoming events. So here is a brief information. Uh, feel free to use any of these sources. Now, I think we can move to the uh, presentation. And uh, Anne Fleur, can you please unmute yourself and uh, start the video? I'll stop sharing the screen. Okay, sounds good. So um, one thing that I would like to um, talk today, uh, to talk about today is um, confirmation bias, value add. So I'm a practitioner. I'm going to start by saying that. Um, I'll have a, a little intro slide, but really the, the topic today is, you know, about utilizing machine learning techniques for forecasts versus other techniques. And as a practitioner, um, I'll share my perspective about what it means and um, um, how do I usually train my team to look at uh, what we do in terms of machine learning implementations and operations. Um, I'll, uh, uh, you know, uh, quote um, uh, somebody at Canaxis. Uh, her name is uh, Polly, Michelle Guthrie, and... Um, uh, I work a lot with her and uh, she always says that, you know, the math is a very small part of the overall equation and around the math, there's basically all the operations um, and that's the really hard part eventually, like productionizing those models, making sure they deliver value, not in measurement only, but in practice like for, for, for the company, like how do we translate that to a return on investment? How do we make sure that they are in the production systems and they are being, you know, implemented in a way that will consistently, sustainably um, deliver on their promise? So that's the perspective I am coming from. This is what I do, but this is what my team does. Um, applying machine learning for production systems, for businesses, uh, and trying to find uh, the way to do so um, to deliver value in time. So um, I'll get uh, started with a little, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, warmer slide. Um, so, so we do know machine learning is revolutionizing our lives, right? Like this is not about whether machine learning is a revolution or not. I mean, I do work. 
uh, in it. And I'm, I'm um, definitely like um, seeing the, the value in many ways, but this will be more applied to forecasting. And as a um, quick uh, uh, teaser, see for yourself if you can uh, distinguish the dogs and the muffins. Um, like there's really hard stuff that, you know, uh, machine learning right now is, is doing better and better. Um, so um, that was a little warmer to get us started. Um, also, in terms of introductions, um, for uh, those in the audience who do not know who Kinaxis is. So um, Kinaxis is a company, um, it's a global company headquartered in Ottawa. We also have, uh, uh, you know, offices in Chennai, offices in Tokyo, and a lot more satellite offices all across the world. Um, and in 2022, we had, uh, we've been there for some time, but we had the privilege to be uh, uh, considered leaders uh, on the top right of the quadrant by Gartner uh, for supply chain uh, planning solution. This is really what we do. So we work with many companies um, and they provide a software for them to uh, better manage uh, their supply chains and especially make better planning decisions. So that goes from demand planning to supply planning uh, concurrently. And, uh, you know, it uh, goes through the, the demand forecast, of course, but it goes through the consensus process for forecasting demand. Um, it goes through uh, inventory optimization. Um, and right now we're also getting into the uh, execution of it in terms of, uh, you know, transportation, um, truckload optimizations. Um, so um, basically covering the end-to-end -end supply chain um, twin. Um, those are some of the clients we work with. Um, so um, this is, uh, you know, an ever growing base. Uh, I won't spend too much time on, on this one, just to give you a bit of an idea of, uh, of the, also the industries. So everything we do in terms of software is not necessarily for just one industry. We're going across, you know, uh, various, um, various needs, various requirements, various configurations with all the implications that it has in terms of productionizing machine learning. And that's a little bit about me. So um, I'm a director for Advanced Analytics Services. So um, I, I'm part of a team who's, um, uh, that's called um, Strategic Services. <clears throat> Sorry for my voice. Um, and um, we basically bring innovation to market. So this is really what I do. Machine learning is one of the big areas, of course, but anything advanced analytics innovations, my team takes from our product teams, some partners as well, bring it to market for our clients, pilot it. We do field innovation until it matures and it's available for more like, uh, uh, you know, standard implementations. Um, and I can't see any hands up or anybody, so feel free to, uh, uh, you know, uh, interrupt if you have like a burning question. Otherwise, I'll make sure that we have uh, some time at the end to uh, to do some Q Q and A. So I'll start by going through, um, you know, when to use machine learning for forecasting. Um, and that's something that I, um, you know, call that in the abstract, like being uh, like working with clients, um, there's a lot of buzz around machine learning and it's more or less understood, you know, some people will have a very deep understanding, some people would not have necessarily worked in it, but have heard about it and they want to implement it for their own companies. Um, and, you know, um, it, it's not necessarily something still well defined in the practice world when to use machine learning versus versus not in the sense that it's not a reflex for most um, clients that I've worked with um, to think about this, like to ask themselves that question. Um, I have had more conversations around, oh, like, you know, um, I, I just get machine learning, so all my problems are going to be solved. Um, 
oh, I get machine learning, so I'm going to get ever increasing accuracy up to 100% for all my forecasts and all my products at the lowest level of granularity. And no matter if it's, you know, pandemic or not, um, th there's a lot of uh, misconceptions and there's a lot of excitement. Um, but this is always where, as a practitioner, um, I ask my team to start asking themselves, asking the clients, is that the right, is that the right method for the purpose that we have, right? And so in my team, we have a bit of a um, different naming convention for our roles. Um, in my team, I have roles for business data scientists, and that's because I want them to focus on the problem that we are solving um, and the value that it will bring to the business. So it's uh, really a practitioner like a, a, you know a take on it um but it's really about okay what do we use it doesn't have to be you know the the state of the art it doesn't have to be i mean state of the art like the bleeding edge uh kind of like models because it needs to be implementable it needs to be productionizable it needs to be sustained over time but it also needs to provide value and we'll see that a little bit after about what value means in that case um, but I always ask my team to first define the problem. Like, what are we trying to solve for exactly? Are oh, there are similar problems and why it needs to be solved, right? So some problems do not need machine learning to be solved. And, you know, um, machine learning comes with a cost. We'll see that as well. So that's for me a critical question I always, always spend time on. Um, you know, what are the benefits of it? Like, why do we need to do it that way? Um, and I also ask how to solve it manually. Like if somebody was to solve it manually, how does it work? What are the results that we 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 have? And then what are the different methods that we can apply? And what are the different benefits from those? Like what are the trade-offs, right? And then in terms of trade-off, we also look at uh, the level of maturity of the company. Like you have companies sometimes that, you know, do not really have a centralized uh, uh, base for the data and some data that are that is critical for a uh, machine learning forecast, say for a demand forecast. If uh, the the different sales, for example, are all in different Excel's owned by individuals without any centralized database, any machine readable uh, format, that's a low maturity on the data. Perhaps machine learning right away is not the right thing to do. It's going to be a very big jump, right, from an operation standpoint to get to the level that would be required to really productionize and implement machine learning effectively. So there's a lot of factors, right? And what's the budget? Like in terms of, you know, the, the, the infrastructure, like we will need, uh, you know, high computational capacity, like, you know, um, public clouds. So is that in place? Like, is that infrastructure here? And are the budgets available to sustain uh, a lot of compute power uh, over time, it, it can be costly, and we'll talk again about it as well. Um, and so, uh, and is there enough time as well? Like, is that something that needs to be done in like four weeks, or is it something that we do have time to um, to uh, 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 implement and and refine? And so, um, this is really like the key message here is uh, from a practitioner standpoint. The, the key aspect is not to say, you know, um, machine learning, machine learning, machine learning. It's to say, well, what is the problem? Does it require it? And is the company ready to, uh, you know, um, to implement and to sustain such a technology? And sometimes there are different steps to get there. Um, and sometimes some, uh, you know, uh, simpler ways can just be sufficient um, uh, for 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 certain companies. So um, those are really the key first questions that I will always ask my team to to go through. We always go through that with our clients, and sometimes it it surprises because clients some clients can expect you know that you get machine learning and everything works, um, and um, but but those are really the right questions in my mind to make sure that there's a fit um, and that we avoid surprises afterwards for the clients when there's already a significant investment that has been made. 
So um, the um, maturity also goes through the data, right? We talked about the systems a little bit, but um, there's also in terms of the kind of data we have at hand, right? If we have like super erratic um, profiles, perhaps a naive approach might do, right, for those. And we focus really on a subset that is a bit more smooth and promising in terms of how far we can bring it in terms of accuracy. Um, and um, that's also something that uh, we always um, try to do upfront, like understanding the data patterns and the forecastability of the different items that we have at hand. It helps set the expectations, obviously, for the, the clients, like, uh, you know, uh, it, it gives them, it grounds them in terms of like what to expect for certain subsets. And it will also save time and so save money in terms of uh, focusing on the subset that can deliver the most value eventually. Um, so that's a little bit on the on the data, but that's something that we um, we also always do, right? So when to apply machine learning, there's the overall problem, there's you know the, the trade-offs like in terms of cost, in terms of time, but there's also when to apply it in terms of the the, the data that we have at hand, the different types of products, um, the, the fundamental data patterns. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, um, that's basically uh, some factors to consider, but there's also elements that will definitely be an advantage for which it will be an advantage to use machine learning. Um, if you have a lot of a large, good quality data set, it's all centralized, um, it's, you know, readily available, your markets are rather volatile, you want to go to a very low level of granularity, you have fast moving products that are expensive, you know, some factors will definitely uh, make machine learning uh, an attractive solution, but it's a balance and it's really about assessing the trade offs um, between those various factors. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what the definition of success. So um, we've we've analyzed the trade off. We know that there are, you know, some um, some uh, situations or some uh, projects that uh, may not qualify for a machine learning implementation. But for those that do, there's also, you know, uh, um, an estimation to make in terms of the return on investment. Like when we do, for example, a machine learning forecast or a forecast in general, we try to, you know, go for accuracy uh, in particular. And uh, what does it mean really for the company, right? Like what are the uh, different levers that we're actually actioning on? Because we can measure that in terms of WMAP, WRMSSC. We can measure that in very different ways and say, yeah, we have like, you know, 5% improvement in accuracy. Okay, uh, from a business standpoint, from a practitioner standpoint, what does it mean? Like, uh, you know, the, the answer we would get a lot of times is so what? And so it's important also to have a framework and this is really difficult to do, but this is really where uh, the core of the return on investment is, is what, how much of an accuracy bump do I need to make any of the other levers that you see on the screen move, right? Because the hope eventually is with a much higher accuracy, uh, you know, we're going to uh, decrease, uh, you know, the need for inventory. Let's say if uh, we don't um, over forecast so much, basically we do have a reduction in, in, in inventory. This is what you see on the lower part of the screen or miss sales stock apps, right? If you don't under forecast so much, then you should be, um, you know, not having so many stock apps as well. So your working capital is also, uh, you know, uh, uh, like being reduced. So um, basically then you should become more efficient at the replenishment side, which is always linked, especially for retail and for uh, CPG, which we're working on a lot right now. This is like, you know, the other part of the equation. And this is where we start talking about business process and operations, right? Like from a practitioner standpoint, a machine learning implementation of forecasts 
um, accuracy exercise doesn't stop at its measurement, right? It stops uh, much later when we talk about the overall uh, value and for the business, the net profit, net cost, right? And uh, eventually the return on capital. So it's important to see the bigger picture also when we go into a machine learning implementation about why we're doing what we're doing and do we have the other elements in place besides the machine learning forecast to be able to uh, materialize the um, um, improvements in forecast accuracy. So do we have, you know, the um, replenishment systems reviewed? Do we have, you know, like a way to measure and track the impact on the availability of the different, uh, you know, uh, products? Do we have a way to link it back to the lead times? And uh, how do we integrate those different pieces to be able to uh, have a value chain eventually that we can track and that we can measure and that we know that there is a true uh, a true return and that it's not just an exercise and we don't really know afterwards like where it goes right and this is where having like a software with both demand and supply concurrently managed uh, a digital twin of the supply chain can also provide a bit of a value chain that we can then start tracking and link back to uh, to actual return on investment. So that's a practitioner's also uh, point of view as well. You know, it's um, it's a very very grounded <clears throat> in terms of the um, uh, return on investment um, more than um, the uh, the accuracy measure only. Um, and there's also obviously like. In that situation, when we expand a little bit the, the, the vision across what we're trying to achieve for a specific business, um, it, it becomes, OK, what are the side effects potentially that we can have on downstream uh, work? And by that, what I mean is say, and we, it's a situation like we've, uh, you know, um, come across quite a bit, in fact, with my team last year. That's why I'm also like, um, sharing that right now as a perspective. Um, so um, we had uh, a, requ a requirement from one of the clients we work uh, for to provide machine learning forecasts at a daily level. So there's obviously a cost in the pipelines. Like imagine you have, and we're talking of course, like a lot of data here. And we're basically taking on daily data and we are rerunning uh regenerating the forecasts every single day so it was seen a bit of, of a challenge you know and challenge taken great like made it happen and from a supply side so when you have the demand you know you have your demand plan and you say okay this is how much is going to be uh sold at those different locations at those different days you hand that over to the supply planners, right? The supply planners will do their own plan even more detailed and they say, well, if that's how much I'm going to set at those locations every day, then this is, you know, how much inventory I need. This is how I'm going to load my trucks. This is how I, I do my routing, how I do my transportation. And so as a supply planner, I get that day one, I have to turn around, you know, the different uh, assets physical assets, we're talking like, you know, there's a time constraint, like we're not talking software anymore. We're talking like the execution, the physical execution of the plan. Um, if my forecast varies by millions of units from one day to another, how do I adapt? You know, um, so that's one of the side effects of forecast accuracy on a daily basis. You have variability and that variability translates from an execution standpoint into something very difficult to do because there are physical constraints to the production scheduling to this to the actual supply and to the physical assets to deploy um, your inventory and to to transport uh, your your various units. So that's also something that you 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 will see here uh, will then um, cancel or worsen 
the return on investment because you've done a, a great investment on machine learning. You have it daily. It's wonderful. It great accuracy, but basically your operations downstream can get can get screwed up. So it's important to have like a much bigger picture in mind. And so you might also ask yourself, uh, well, that's good, but how much of an accuracy improvement makes it worth overall? So that's an, a question that we asked ourselves as well. Um, uh, about a year and a half ago, we, we derived a few studies um, and um, we took also like a, a few of our customers to kind of understand, um, you know, when do we use machine learning? Like what kind of improvements should we be targeting? to say that all else equal, it should probably be worth it to, to implement it. And we find that we need at least a 10, 15% improvement um, to derive the benefits that you see um, in, the, in the lower boxes. And so if we can do this, you know, in a way that does enable all the downstream um, work as well, like eventually there will be improved operations and faster decision making and greater efficiency. But it's, um, you know, the ball is in the details. Like the, the practice of it really requires us to look at, to look beyond the pure machine learning exercise and to really um, assess the various um, articulations of the forecasting exercise with uh many more kpis than just the measurement of the accuracy so um that's about when to use machine learning so those are the few considerations that um you know um i would recommend to um always go through and and this is this is difficult stuff <laughs> this is why you know um implementing machine learning is never like uh, you know a walk in the park uh, and there's also many different considerations but those are definitely the ones that from um you know um, a team that implements machine learning constantly for production pr uh, purposes through projects we would always ask ourselves and try to to do that assessment so what does it mean then when we we've done the assessment and we're like okay well this is you know, there's a business case, there's the maturity, uh, we've done the exercise for the return on investment, we have the different knobs in place, we know that we can track and follow through um, the different processes, like the impact that the machine learning uh, forecast will have. And we've done our forecastability assessment, we know that we can, we, we probably have some margin to, to um, improve and it's worth trying it. So then the idea is, OK, well, how do we get, which data do we get? Like we have also a lot of clients who have very good processes, very mature, excellent management of their data as an asset. Um, very, we've seen very impressive, very impressive uh, uh, data management uh, systems and um, investments in, in making that very robust. But which data do we do we take? Like, do we really take everything? And so I want to uh, pay a tribute here to one of my previous um, professors um, at MIT, and he had a way to say big data, small info syndrome. Um, and you know, in the world today, like uh, there was like 64 zettabytes. I looked up the stats in 2020, 79. In 2021, we're 90 plus, I believe, uh, as of 2022. Um, billions and billions of emails and like massive data everywhere. But um, Roberto Rigobon was always the person who was saying, have a question before you have the data. Like know, know what you're trying to solve for. So even if you know that for the purpose of the exercise, machine learning is probably a good idea, um, we need to be uh, still very rigorous in terms of which data do we get do we ask for? Um, and if there's additional data that needs to be collected, it needs to be designed, you know, accordingly. Um, 
looking always between correlation causation have a lot of confounding variables all the time so that rigor in in setting up the uh you know uh the, the project is uh is still critical and the rigor on the outcome right so if you think about for example um like a, a retail um or in general actually demand forecasting um you could have multiple outcomes of the uh, in terms of forecast. Like, do you want to forecast for the point of sale data, like the true demand from customers? Or do you want to forecast for shipments? Or do you want to forecast for orders? And what's the difference in the choice you make, right? So if you, for example, if you forecast for order, you forecast for the actual demand that came in. If you want to forecast for shipments, you have basically integrated the shipping constraints in your forecast because there's a lot of orders that will be canceled that will not that, for example, the company will not be able to 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 match. Um, and so now you're forecasting, including those changes, right? So so what is it really that we want to forecast for? What is the outcome that we're looking for and what does it mean? Um, and I'm going to probably quote here our CEO um, who, as soon as I joined Kinexis, told me, like, don't fall in love with what your software does, but with what it means. And there's a big difference here as well. Right. And it's and that's what drives basically in the end, like information knowledge, like not having a forecast to have a forecast. And we don't really understand what really the forecast implications are. So that's um, definitely something really really critical and um, uh, usually I have a bit of a quiz with that slide but I can't see really anybody so um, uh, I'll just uh, walk you through um, in terms of you know knowledge um, if you have a buy one get one free item or if you have a 50 person off uh, and I'm sure everybody on this call is probably very rational very logical and you would think that, OK, well, it's about the same, right? It's about a 50 percent off in the end. Um, but from a promotion effectiveness, like if you're trying to, from a retailer standpoint, understand forecasts based on, you know, uh, different types of promotions, different types of mechanics, different types of rewards. And you want to actually acquire knowledge from the data in terms of, OK, well, what is more effective? Which one do you think is more effective between a buy one, get one and the 50% off? For me, it was hard to tell initially. I was like, OK, well, it's probably probably about the same. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> Psychology is weird. And so um, you will have the 50% off daily sales average price. You can see that it's actually probably even a better deal overall because you have like some people even if it's a buy one get one still manage to just buy one or buy three so you get like half part of the deal whereas if you had bought three at 50 percent off you would have you would have had 50 percent off on the three articles that you would have bought right um regardless <clears throat> the sales are more important for buy one get ones so um uh, you know Going from knowing what data you, you ask for, going through the analysis, the information, deriving knowledge and making sure that this is what is being fed correctly, usefully to the machine learning models, depending on the goal that you have, for example, like which, uh, you know, um, uh, how many sales, depending on how effective promotions are uh, for that particular retailer is definitely uh, uh, where we start. Um, and sometimes it can be it can be surprising. Um, the other aspect then uh, beyond the the data itself, so um, is uh, really about what I like to call a cams razor. So I'm a strong believer that you know uh, we really need to look at even if we have a, a good use case for machine learning, look at different options. And um, um, I want to also refer here to the M5 competition. So um, it was about retail um, and we do have retail as well, but um, um, 
purposefully, uh, I wanted to also give you another example for another industry, which is related to a certain extent, uh, the consumer packaged goods. And so um, happens that we also using uh, light GVM and that's um, definitely competition in the past few years have highlighted that model a lot. Um, but also what you can see is that the, the data that was used is, you know, um, mindfully selected. And um, we've tried like a few, um, you know, experiments like we've basically used also. So we're using shipments because uh, from a consumer package good standpoint, um, you probably want to forecast what you ship because you want to take into ac account your constraints in terms of the production. Um, how much can you produce? How much can you ship? So that also can be debated. Um, I'm aware of that, but I'm trying to give you like the um, basic idea why that particular client wanted to take shipments. Um, promotions, obviously. Um, there's a lot of calendars, uh, calendar related data that we take, which is really helpful, like holiday calendars, for example, um, that will tell you a uh, good amount of information. Uh, around certain sales patterns and of course master data and you can see that we have a pretty low level of um, um, uh, forecast resolution um, and so um, we've done like a few um, a few uh, uh, experiments between different statistical methods uh, best fit as well and uh, you know like GBM um, on the light GBM side, we have definitely like platforms and we have uh, workflows and that's because of productization. So we're not in a case where we can just get a cluster right on our code, get the data and, you know, it's product productionizable. So um, there's a, a productization in place where we can sustain X number of customers on the same platform on different versions. So a lot of layers will be abstracted. Um, and um, that means that to a certain extent, customization that would be possible if you were just to develop something on your local computer, for example, um, that kind of customization can be limited. So that's something also to take into account. Um, and um, something that we look at obviously is also the computational costs that need to be balanced. So for certain retailers, like we have billions of forecasts per week because the promotions can be weekly or less than weekly. You can have one day promotions, three day promotions. Um, so, you know, when you have to pull billions of forecasts every week, um, the, the overall uh, cloud cost bill can be pretty, pretty high. Like um, it wouldn't be um, like we have, uh, you know, clients who have, a few hundred thousands of dollars uh, per month uh, going into computation costs. Um, and, um, you know, we need also to plan for the integration with the enterprise planning systems. And those are all highlighted in the M5 competition uh, research um, and results and findings. Um, but, you know, um, it's definitely th exactly the same. That's why I'm putting both here that we're going through. So um, I definitely recommend the reading of those um, those results. Um, Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. To interrupt. Uh, can can you please start wrapping up? I think we are running out of time slowly. Oh, sounds good. Of course. Um, so you. I apologize. I thought we had an hour, so maybe I um, I, I underestimated this. So this is to give you a bit of an idea. Um, and so in terms of the different levels of accuracy, the machine learning is here. For example, that's uh, for the month of November about 80%, 74% for the stat forecast. So again, that question about the baseline, you know, like that that might be much more inexpensive to, to run. So are we having enough um, to, to justify? And in December, uh, you can see that the difference is higher. It's a much more difficult month, obviously, to forecast for. So you also need to look at that over time. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but here you can see also a statistical forecast. We did another case study versus LGBM in the same vibe. Um, and this was um, about the variability that was induced by the accuracy. We talked a little bit about it, so I'm going to go faster on this. 
Um, one thing that I want to highlight is really about the interpretability from a practitioner standpoint. The machine learning forecast will not be trusted if there's no um, explainability around it. So we're using like something around the, the SHAP um, values and we have a framework for it, but um, it is not, um, it, it is never a situation where we can implement and productionize machine learning as a practitioner without having the capacity to explain. And we go back to the correlation versus causation challenge, um, but we need to explain to users why the forecast results are what they are. Um, and obviously in terms of cloud and today's expectations, users expect that, you know, it will always be fast, available, there's no downtime. You can think about Google Maps, you know, like, um, or for whoever is from that generation, the fail whale from Twitter. Um, this is not something that you want ever to have, right? So we also need to have to be able to productionize machine learning, a reactive design where we stay elastic, responsive, resilient. I won't go into the details then, but you can look it up. Reactive design it is this something that is uh, pretty much needed as part of the operations of machine learning. Um, and so in terms of conclusions, um, so there's definitely really like a um, um, a critical um, you know assessment to make at the very beginning when we are applying as practitioner machine learning uh, to um, a business in terms of readiness, uh, in terms of trade-offs, um, and it is not guaranteed, you know, that there is a better performance with machine learning, like we have seen in certain cases, um, you know, uh, other methods holding really well. And we need to have a certain better performance. Like it cannot be one person, two person improvement because that that might be completely washed out anyway downstream. Like we need to really have that bigger perspective in terms of ROI. And so that's why sometimes like, you know, cheaper methods can be really competitive. And so it depends of course of the data, the uh, amount of pre-processing required, there's computation power restrictions or like, uh, you know, budget restrictions. On the other side, if your RI is worth it and you have really everything uh, in control and invisible and computation is available, budget is available and you, you can have like forecast improvement of 15% or more on certain of the products with machine learning, then that's probably where um, I would consider that there's a strong value in, in implementing it. So I'll stop here. Um, Ivan, let me know if there's any questions. I, can. I think Ivan had a problem with his computer. Uh, <laughs> he right. Like <laughs> well, yeah. uh, I'll, uh, I'll ask a question then, since Ivan is not monitoring me. Um, Robert Farns here. Um, just what do you see the role of the demand planner? How is that being changed by uh, the introduction of machine learning? That's a really, really good question. Um, there's a new persona that has entered the stage, which is the, dim the data scientist. So um, the configurations that I see is for the dim and planner, they can't really, most of them do not want, do not have the time for whatever reason, be a data scientist. And so from a, a software planning perspective, we have the choice between two routes. If I simplify things, one thing is to automate everything. And this is why um, in some of the previous slides, I had like an auto ML com co uh, comparison um, in the sense that it's a black box. That's the problem with that method. Because demon planners also do not want a black box, um, but they do not have time or do not want to acquire the skills to be setting up a data science forecast or a machine learning forecast on their own, right? So either we have some, we have a trade off here again, like either we have more automation but it will be a bit more on the black box side and demand planners will be enabled to get a machine learning forecast and operate with you know a few knobs exposing the software very simplified uh very guided or we need to have a data scientist team and a lot of companies have invested in the data scientist team in fact um where those data scientists are maintaining uh you know the the the, the, the forecasting uh, um, when needed, 
Uh, so if there are additional data sources that are being added, or if there is a forecast drift, for example, um, then there would be somebody with those skills to work for the demand planners to set things up and the demand planners can still operate. But that has created a bit of a, a complexity uh, compared to the, 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 the previous generation of, uh, of techniques. Right. Uh, sorry for disappearing. I had some issues with my computer. I'm back. Uh, and thanks a lot for the presentation. Sorry that I had to rush it in the end, uh, because I've also asked uh, Nikos Karenzis to act as a discussant and you know provide some comments and questions. So Nikos, can you please uh, show yourself and I'll here I am. See what you have to say? <laughs> First of uh, all, um, thanks a lot for the presentation. There were a lot of good points and a lot of uh, interesting hooks for further questions. But I will not go to all of them because then I will have to go slide by slide. Uh, there were a lot of nice thoughts there. But I will go to a few points that uh, perhaps I can have a few more things to say due to my research. You made the very good point about accuracy not being the end point because forecasts are there to support decisions and operations and so on. Um, and then you made the connection with the return on investment, which I think is a very valid point. However, one point I will uh, say here is that I don't think research for sure, and I put a question mark on practice here, is actually ready to make that connection in a very realistic way. What I'm trying to say with this comment, um, it's easy to come up with a theoretical connection between accuracy and return of investment in the style of saying, all right, we increase accuracy, therefore we expect the, uh, let's say, inventory performance to improve, and then we can figure out some average point. But that wouldn't necessarily allow us to easily connect it to say an improvement in accuracy by X percent means a return on investment by Y percent, especially if we want to reach down to the monetary value. I'm not suggesting it's impossible. The, the issue I see here is a matter of computational cost unless we devise better metrics. I don't think that the metrics we're currently using, at least in the forecasting side, are easy to connect to the return of investment. Now, is that because we need more research or because it's pragmatically very difficult to do? I think that's still an open question, but it's important to distinguish between having a theoretical connection between return of investment and improvement in accuracy, which as a forecaster myself would like to think it's a strong connection, but also from the other side, connecting to individual choices of modeling for particular items and so on. So I think that's one aspect that is quite interesting. And that also connects with the forecastability uh, argument. And uh, I think you, you made a lot of uh, points on that in your presentation, that um, what is really the objective of, of the company? What do they really want to forecast and why? So when I'm thinking about forecastability, essentially it cannot be disentangled by the, from the objective. Uh, I would have from different objectives, I would need necessarily different metrics to say something I can forecast well or not against some established benchmark or not. So the, the, the notion of forecastability, I think it's still a bit elusive. I think we can make a per case argument, but I think it's very difficult to make a definition of forecastability that is reliable and robust enough, which brings me a bit to the following point. Um, from one hand, when we say we go to an organization and we implement uh, a forecasting process, and I quite like that you start from the very beginning, challenge what is the point of the forecasting, what are exactly objectives, why are we doing it, what do we want to, to achieve? I think this is a fantastic starting point. But once we then move to the algorithms and so on, eventually what we end up doing, we end up, end up educating our company partners uh, into a particular way of thinking of forecasting. And if in that we're not careful in the definitions of things like forecastability and so on, we can easily end up um, being blind to our own, if you wish, biases. It's, you can see that in the forecasting literature, you mentioned the M5 paper there as well. We still stick to particular um, accuracy metrics that have been well criticized, both in literature and practice. Yet we use this as a basis for all our thinking about how to implement forecasting in practice. So I believe these are questions that now they were open all the time, but now they are very evidently open questions. And I think they they worth a bit of pushback, both from practice and uh, research. 
And I will touch one last point so that I leave some time for questions from other people um, about the trustworthiness of um, models. Now, uh, I appreciate that we didn't have the chance to go into that in much detail because it was towards the end of the presentation. But I, I like that you showed that um, you're using the supply and equivalent to other people have used Lime to sort of get a feeling of what the model is doing. Mm -hmm. However, I'll put yet another question mark on trustworthiness, and I will not put it on machine learning, actually. I will put on statistical models. Suppose I have a regression that we all think it's a transparent model, but it has five or six explanatory variables and potentially an autoregression as well. Can we really make sense of these coefficients? Can we really think of these coefficients separately, especially when we have dynamics in our models? If it's so difficult for statistical models, then when we move to, mo to machine learning models or AI models, are we really looking for explaining what the model is really capturing in terms of, uh, let's say, salient features or for picking up coefficients? The point I'm trying to make here is why do we want this transparency? We want transparency to build trustworthiness from one hand. And from the other hand, we want this to help potential planners and users to adjust forecasts when need be, when they have additional information. So that they avoid doing double work or in some sense already manipulating numbers for information that's incorporated in them. Because if I look at just coefficients or obtaining these values, let's say, from the traditional techniques in machine learning to get a bit of the significance of variables, and I would do that in a rolling origin uh, point of view, I will see this, these coefficients vary a lot. And some models vary, they vary with a small standard deviation. In some models, they can vary dramatically. And that is true even for statistics. It's not a critique for machine learning here. So again, I put a question mark if we understand trustworthiness enough or that in itself requires some additional research, given that it's from one hand for people to buy, if I can use that word, our forecast, but more importantly, to help them get a better decision in which sense they need to understand why they will trust this algorithm and how. Perhaps half a minute for our last point. I think computational cost of machine learning is a very interesting um, aspect to think of. I would love to that sustainability. Sometimes we go with machine learning because it's more hyped, and I'm not arguing against um, uh, the, the distinctions you make here when machine learning is useful. But I will say that sometimes machine learning offers a marginal increase over a simpler approach at substantially more computational cost, at substantially more electricity cost. And if we always say like, OK, but it still works, it's simple for us, maybe it actually is not sustainable to think along those directions. Maybe it's sometimes sustainable to think, if I'm going to face that uncertainty, that loss of return of investment, accuracy, however I want to go that direction, maybe it's OK because it's more sustainable to have a very fast and simple algorithm. And I will stop here. Thank you for the presentation. Yeah. Should there's we move to uni? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot. That's true. A lot. <laughs> but those are all really, really good points. Um, so, um, yeah, perhaps on the last point on the explainability side. So there's the aspect of trust, um, like, you know, um, and for uh, demand forecasting, it's grounded in the fact that we're talking about a consensus process and you really have two takes on it, if I simplify again, on the on the business side right now, you have, um, you know, vendors who say, um, I replace demand planners. So everything, it's basically the, um, you know, um, uh, you know, um, like driverless cars, you have a bit of a driverless uh, process. And so, Currently, the consensus process, and I, I, perhaps I should start there. Um, the, so the other uh, take on it is, you know, some other vendors want to augment the capacities of demand planners. And before I, now that I've said those two paths, I should probably, uh, you know, level set for everybody on the call. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the consensus process per se in forecasting, just in case uh, I'll quickly go through. Um, so you start with a baseline, and that baseline can be a stat forecast. It can be also a forecast from the sales team. It can be a forecast from the marketing team, or it can be a machine learning forecast. And after that, basically the demand planners will, you know, get some lifts that they they take. Um, this is where there's 
Uh, it's a bit of a mixed forecast where you can take also some qualitative forecast on top of the quantitative forecast. Because, um, for example, there's a huge order that sales placed. It's a one of a kind in 10 years. But they know about it. It's not in the past data. So as a demand planner, you know, I'm going to talk to the sales team and I'm going to be like, huh, you know, I get I need to get a lift uh, that particular month because this is happening. So you have that lift portion and then, yes, you do have adjustments and overrides overall, but then you get to a first number and that number is discussed. There's a, a insane number of meetings between a lot of different teams to then come up to the final forecast, the consensus forecast. It's a consensus right now. So you have a lot of perspectives and you, you, you basically go into justifications and why is it going down here? Why is it going up here? As a marketing person, I know there's new product being introduced, so you should definitely go like higher on this. As a salesperson, I know have a deal that's been accepted here, so you should definitely go higher on this and it's not in your past data. Like you have a lot of consensus happening, like an insane number of meetings, right? And this is the consensus process. This is a demand planning process in most companies as it stands. And so going back to those two takes, basically one take is to say, get rid of that, go for efficiency, you get a machine learning forecast and you know it's gonna basically be your new consensus uh, process. Or you have, well, you still need to have that consensus, but you know, we're gonna give you a better baseline. Both, both uh, alternatives are on the market. In the case of, you know, explainability, um, that will currently, if you keep the consensus, it will need to support the justifications, right? So yeah, if I have a, a machine learning baseline or a stat baseline, it applies for any baseline really. Um, I want to be able to say, uh, if I'm challenged on the numbers as a demand planner and I'm being asked, why are you increasing the forecast here? Why did why did you decrease it here? Why why that new number? I want to be able to say, okay, well, there are certain factors that are influencing the forecast and have a discussion. If I have no idea, if I just have a number, then my number is just as good as the salespeople number. And that becomes very difficult to go through those meetings and those justifications, right? This is why, um, and to your point, um, maybe there's no uh, no good concept of explainability for a stat forecast either and until now it's been judgmental and it's been like a struggle this has been a pain point um and this is why in some companies if the sales force is very uh, if the sales team is very uh, strong then they'll overtake the forecasts but the machine learning idea has introduced in the minds of demand planners that there might be a possibility to have additional and analytical rigor through certain explain explainability frameworks that would enable them to solve that pain point. And um, that definitely has come with machine learning and machine learning has that reputation also to be a bit of a black box. You know, people have, although we're not using neural nets or different more complex techniques because of that problem, people have that kind of like perspective in the background as well. So there's a bit of an additional expectation on machine learning and because of the process because it's a consensus process we can't do without explaining like they will then 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 just stick to other methods they already have because they don't want just another number and you know then there's another uh, uh you know um trend that just says well screw all that Machine learning has better accuracy, so we just go and it will drive your processes and we're going to automate basically a lot of the processes based on. So that's a totally different take and has totally different, um, you know, uh, implications to it. But um, that's that's the perspective that I have right now on, on what I see when it comes to explainability for machine learning as a requirement. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Nikos, for your comments. Thank you, Anna Floor, for your responses and your presentation. Well, we have uh, one question, but I think it's sort of uh, touched upon anyway, uh, saying how do clients react when they find out that a simple non-machine learning solution can be implemented? Uh, clients? Clients uh, react when they find out that there is a, an option of a simpler solution that you can do instead of ML. It's um so it's always an interesting conversation. 
um, because there's a belief and there's a hype. Uh, so they, they, they come in and they're like, they really want machine learning, or they, otherwise they have the impression they, they, they're not a leader or that they're missing out. So there's definitely, it's a bit of an awkward discussion in many times. Um, then, you know, we can do, oftentimes we do a proof of concept. Oftentimes we go through forecastability to also show them, explain to them data patterns. We take the time to go through the assessment that I was going through at the beginning. And when they see the cost, the time, the potential for improvement assessed, and the difficulty uh, also to, to the previous point of, um, you know, if they don't have really slick processes to understand how those improvements will translate into actual value, um, it becomes a bit more of a uh, constructive discussion and overall, it, it creates trust with clients. Like um, the worst case is you go, yeah, 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 machine learning, go for it. And a few millions dollars later, uh, they don't have the results they necessarily expected or they have it at a, uh, you know, they're going to compare to their stat baseline. They're going to compare to their current models. And if it's not enough, then there's going to be much more difficult conversations. And this is where you get into some of the oh, machine learning isn't working. You get into like, you know, the high curve, right? Like you have like a super hype and then it kind of crashes because the expectations were set way too high. So I, I find that it's usually it has been more rewarding as a path, as a practitioner to have those conversations from the get go. And sometimes, you know, if clients are like, well, I don't want to listen to you as machine learning or nothing else, then sure, you know, we'll we'll do it. But then we at least had the transparency and the honesty to to walk them through what it means and what they will get and what they could have gotten otherwise, like the comp the trade-offs and the comparison. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, we ran out of time, uh, but thank you very much for uh, presenting and thanks everyone for attending. No and uh, well, see you all uh, in a month's time if you want to attend our next webinar. Absolutely, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you for having me. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.